if you already have the skill, thinking is terrible. Thinking really messes you up. And... Okay, today I'm speaking with Dr. Ted Slingerland, who's a professor of philosophy and associate member in the Asian Studies and Psychology Departments at the University of British Columbia. He's an expert on the cognitive science of ancient philosophies. Dr. Slingerland is the author of several books, including Trying Not to Try, Ancient China, Modern Science, and The Power of Spontaneity. And uh, Dr. Slingerland holds degrees from Princeton, Stanford, and UC Berkeley. In this episode, we discuss the science of ancient concepts like Wu Wei, or effortless action, hot versus cold cognition, ways to alter consciousness, and much more. So without further introduction, here is Dr. Ted Slingerland. Yeah, so uh, this is, we've had a, a gaffe with the recording, so we're, we're going to pick this back up, but um, it's already started to be a really interesting conversation. I, I think just to give folks a kind of a catch them up so that you're not repeating yourself, uh, what we're really talking about here is the fusion of ancient wisdom with modern science, which is one of my favorite topics. And uh, you've explored this in, in different cultures uh, in the East and then are fusing that with your understanding of cognitive neuroscience. And the topic that we started to get into was Wu Wei, um, which maybe you could unpack for us a little bit. And we were talking about this, how this is a bit similar to Western flow, but has some important differences. Yeah, so, so Wu Wei, uh, literally no doing, no effort. Uh, I translated as effortless action because it's not a passive state. It's an active state is this spiritual goal for these early Chinese thinkers I look at. So it's a state where you lose a sense of yourself as an agent. Uh, you, you have a feeling of not exerting effort, like things are kind of happening by themselves. You're completely absorbed in what you do. You're also very successful. So everything works out. You're creative. Um, People like you, you're skillful in the world. Um, if you're doing some uh, some activity, some craft in the world. Um, so they all want you to get into this state, these early Chinese thinkers. And it, I compare this state to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's idea of flow. So Western psychologist, actually recently deceased um, this year. Um, and it is similar. So, so Csikszentmihalyi, Csikszentmihalyi's flow has you know, basically all the same phenomenological characteristics. Um, where I think Uwe is more helpful, and this is what I argue in trying not to try, is that Csikszentmihalyi has trouble ruling out certain types of experiences that feel a bit like flow, but only in the moment. Um, so, you know, watching stupid TV, I mean, he didn't know about when he wrote flow, he didn't know about Twitter or YouTube. <laughs> he would have used those if he could have, uh, you know, spending two hours just watching a series of stupid cat videos or um, you lose a sense of yourself as an agent, you lose a sense of the passage of time, and yet you emerge from it feeling crummy, um, feeling kind of dirty, um, uh, you not energized or like fulfilled the way you do when you come out of flow. And so he didn't want to call those states flow, but he needed to figure out what's different about them. And what he settled on was complexity and challenge. So he thinks that true flow states are flow because um, the challenge of the situation <clears throat> perfectly matches your skills. But your skill is going to get better, which means the challenge has to keep ramping up. And so, you know, the, the, he called it the flow channel. Uh, challenge keeps getting harder and harder as your skill gets better. And that keeps you in this flow channel. And I think that works for some flow activities, um, things like rock climbing or sports where you really need to be kind of challenged. Um, but I point out it doesn't really fit very well his own survey data. So the survey data that he and his colleagues have, <clears throat> they ask people, you know, when do you feel in flow? When's the last time you felt in flow? And it tends to be, the answers tend to be things like, you know, walking down the path, this path in my neighborhood that I've walked down a hundred times or playing with my grandchildren. Or um, he, he actually has an extended account of this 
Serafina, this woman in the Swiss Alps who gets into flow, you know, leading her cows to the pasture and kind of milking them and doing these things she's done a hundred times before. Um, there's no challenge or complexity there. So it's unclear how his definition fits that. And this is where I think Wu Wei is more helpful. So for the early Chinese, what distinguishes Wu Wei from what we want, might want to call shitty flow states, you know, kind of crummy flow, um, is that you're getting absorbed into it. For them, it's religious. Um, you're getting absorbed into the Tao. You're in touch with the Tao, the, the way the kind of cosmic way of the universe. Um, and that's what makes it way is that you're in touch with this cosmic force. Um, I think if we want to naturalize that, if we want to talk about it for modern people who don't believe in the Tao or, um, but, you know, which includes me, um, I think the way to rephrase it would be you're in touch with something larger than yourself that you value. And this could be something as simple as just, I value my family. And so I value spending time with my kids. Um, I value nature. And so I you know, value taking the simple walk through the local park because I, I value this landscape. Um, I think that's a much more helpful way to define the state. It's um, you lose a sense of yourself as an agent because you're allowing yourself to be absorbed into something bigger than yourself that you value. And that's why you emerge from the experience feeling energized and feeling like you had a meaningful experience instead of a, a kind of time wasting experience. Yeah, that's fascinating. So Uwe takes into account your belief structures in order to, in order for you to get into that state. Is that right? Yes. I think that's the way to understand it. Um, and again, for the early Chinese, this was an all encompassing metaphysical reality you get in touch with. I think for, I argue in the book that for most modern people, we probably have very fragmented belief systems. So, um, you know, I, I talk about the fact that I get into Uwe in nature, especially certain landscapes like Northern California is like my place. It's like where... I just, when I see the landscape there, something just relaxes inside of me and I feel really good. Um, I get into Uwe cooking. I get into Uwe playing tennis or kayaking. Um, there's no, co I can't tell any coherent story that would weave all of those things together into one meaning system, right? It's, it's almost like I've got a, a series of meaning systems that I move in between ideally. Um, so I think for a lot of modern people, we, 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 we have fragmented meaning systems, but we do have them. We have meaning and that's what, that's, what's giving this state its special, um, its special feel. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so would you say that Wu Wei includes typical psychological flow states of, for example, some of the examples you gave of playing tennis, um, these kind of like action based or, or playing the piano, but also encompasses every more everyday flow states like going for a walk with your family. Yeah, that's why I think it's more useful. And it's again, this is uh, Chicksmihai's own survey data suggests that's really when People aren't usually, you know, doing high stakes rock climbing, right? <laughs> Where they're experiencing flow is having drinks with their friends or, um, you know, relaxing with family. So um, I think it's a way in that sense is a more useful concept than flow is. And I think part of the, and again, you know, talk about ancient wisdom or, uh, you know, why modern science could use an assist every once in a while. Um, you know, Chicksmihai's was coming out of this very individualistic model of the self. And so when he's trying to figure out what distinguishes flow, he's, he's then focusing on very individualistic measures like complexity and challenge. Um, if you, th if you think of the self as, as social fundamentally and as fundamentally kind of embedded in the world and part of the world, um, it's a little bit easier, I think, to see that that's what's just, the distinguishing feature of these experiences. 
And so, yeah, what what does the cognitive science say about the about Wu Wei? Uh, you've got a, a, a good analogy here with hot versus cold. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a mode where your cognitive control is relaxed, and you're functioning primarily using hot systems. So you know, there's this. Uh, uh, two system model of human cognition. We don't want to take it too literally. It's not like there are actual different pathways in the brain or anything. Um, but there are two kind of useful, it's useful to distinguish between two different modes of behavior. One is this um, hot or system one cognition, which is fast, it's mostly unconscious, it's frugal. Um, and that's where we spend most of our time. And a lot of the stuff that's going on is are these hot systems. So I'm not conscious of how I'm forming words. I'm not conscious of pronouncing, pronouncing English. I'm not conscious of um, reaching out and getting a glass of water. I do all these things naturally. Um, that's all system one. System two is um, when you're popping into cold cognition, uh, it's slower, it's conscious, it feels effortful. You really feel yourself doing it. Um, and humans are capable of these two different modes of cognition. And what Uwe represents is a state where you're mostly in this hot, unconscious, effortless mode of, of cognition. But you're also alert. And so I look at, um, there's an interesting study I look at in the book of uh, jazz. They did an fMRI study of jazz penis. And they... Um, you know, scan them as they were doing scales, as they were playing a piece that had already been written out. And then they scan them when they were just improvising. So they said, just improvise. And there's an interesting uh, state they get into where the, the regions normally associated with cognitive control in the brain were down-regulated. So they weren't exerting cognitive control. But one, this one part of the brain, the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, was still quite active. And this seems to be the part of the brain. So we're chugging along in system one, doing everything automatically. A good example of this is, you know, you're walking down the street to your office. It's almost all system one. You're not having to think about how you walk or how to put one foot in front of each other. Um, but you step on a patch of ice and suddenly you've got a, something's wrong, right? And you have to adjust what you're doing and, and you have to call in system two to say, oh, it's icy, you need to walk slower and do maybe you know walk on the side where there's snow and not ice. Um, the ACC is always looking for a disconnect between what you're doing and what the outcomes are. It's kind of an error detection device. Um, the, and it's, it's basically like the trigger that calls in cognitive control when you need it. Um, in these jazz penis, the ACC is very active. And so, and this seems to correspond to the state that people get into when they're athletes or performers, they're, they're kind of on autopilot, but they're alert right? There's a part of their brain that's like watching out for stuff. Um, and it, it really seems to correspond to the story. And um, one of the best Uwe stories in the early Chinese text is the story of Butcher Ding, who's cutting up this ox in the Zhuangzi. Um, you know, he's completely effortless. It looks like he's just dancing and this ox kind of falls apart. And he describes to this Lord who had been watching him um, how he just kind of lets the blade follow his spirit and he, you know, kind of goes along, he's following along effortlessly. Um, but he says, but if I come to a difficult spot, I slow down, you know, I'm cautious, I take my time and then, then I can cut through the knot and everything works. I think he's describing basically, um, system one, system one, system one, ACC pops in and says trouble, pay attention for a second. And then I figure it out and then system one again. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the skillful Uwe state. Um, so it is a state where you're, you have reduced cognitive control and it's automatic systems that are running things primarily. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess based on that understanding, what would you recommend for someone who's trying to get into that state with an activity? So I guess to bring it 
into an, uh, an example that maybe folks could relate to. Um, if you're trying, if you're trying to put a, put a golf ball or, you know, s- some analogous performance situation where you have some skill already and your body knows what to do and you don't want to be overthinking it, but at the same time you want to be focused and you want to execute well under pressure. Uh, what what can we learn from from Uwe about doing that well? It, relax into it. <laughs> relax into it and focus on the goal. Um, so there's actually I review some of the um, sports psychology literature and try not to try because it's very relevant to this. Right. Um, if you already have the skill, thinking is terrible. Thinking really messes you up. And so there's been really interesting studies where with like professional baseball players, if you ask them to think consciously about the angle at which they're swinging the bat, it screws up their hitting. They don't hit as well. Um, There's a very famous uh, social psychology study of college students um, trying to putt, putt a golf ball. And if you tell them, you know, think about how you're swinging and, you know, really focus on getting it into the ball into the cup and don't miss, make sure you don't miss. They screw up. (laughs) They get really nervous and they choke. Um, So there's a, and, and one of the conclusions of the sports psychology research is focusing on the mechanics, consciously focusing on the mechanics disrupts your performance. It's a really bad thing to do if you're already skilled. Um, What you want to do is focus on what your goal is. Um, and so, you know, to use, I play a bit of tennis. I'm still, I'm still bad enough that I do have to actually focus on mechanics. I have to think about what I'm doing with my arms. Um, but when I've been playing a lot and I'm, I'm kind of in, into a state where I can relax a little bit that way, um, you know, I play my best when I'm thinking where I want to put the ball, not how to hit it to get it there. I'm thinking I just want the ball down the line. Um, that's what's that's what you should be focusing on. And then you let your body figure out how to achieve that goal. Um, and I think that, I think that's true for other domains. Um, if you have a job interview and you want to do well, um, you know, you want to impress them and seem confident and competent, um, you shouldn't be focusing on the specific words you're saying or how you should hold your hands or whether or not you should look them in the eye or how firmly you should shake their hand. Um, that's going to be, <laughs> you're going to seem like an automaton. It's going to be horrible. Um, you should just focus on, you know, what do I like about this job? Um, you know, uh, or just focus on the fact that you would be good at the job and that you just need to explain that to these people. So focusing on the goal in a way that's calm and kind of, um, and where you realize that you do have the skill to do it. That's the, that's the way to get into a way. Right. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating that you'd say that because I'd come to a similar conclusion when I was playing tennis actually recently. Uh, i I realized that when I stopped paying attention to my mechanics and just focused on where exactly on the court I wanted the ball to land I was I was doing way better and um and then I can think of other examples uh of this um an example I guess from from my college drinking days would just be if if you're trying to get the ball in the cup and beer pong you're way better off just focusing on the cup rather than trying to have a certain arc or something like that so yeah yeah yeah, that's the beer. I'll use that. That's a good example. Beer pong example. <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of practical applications. I think you said something really important too, though, that I want to reemphasize, which is that this is only if you already have the skill in place, right? So if you're trying to learn a new skill, I imagine it's a very different protocol. Yeah, very different. I mean, there's no easy way. Learning a new skill is about conscious effort. And that's that's one of the reasons that you know, evolutionarily, we have cognitive control is to reprogram our hot cognition so that we can acquire acquire new skills. So, um, I mean, a good example is I, you know, my I'm, 
I played, I took up tennis as an adult. Um, I played previous racket sports. And so I had some really bad habits and I'm trying to break a bad habit on my backhand right now. Um, and if I try to get into a state of Wu while doing a backhand, it doesn't work very well now because <laughs> I just fall back into my bad habit where I collapsing my arm and I'm doing this weird kind of half slice, half ground stroke. Um, but um, so there, so I have to, for a while now, I'm going to have to just be consciously thinking about, I have a set of tricks that I have to um, remember when I do a backhand now. Um, and so it's going to be effortful. It's not going to be away for a little bit. But the idea is if I do that effortfully for a while and I get in enough playing time, I'll start to internalize it. And at some point, doing it the right way will will be effortless. And then I can go back to focusing on, I want to hit a backhand down the line or I want to put it over there. Um, but yeah, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't improvise on the piano unless you know how to play the piano. It's just, it would sound terrible. Um, so, um, you know, my, uh, my ex-wife's brother is a jazz pianist in Rome and, um, you know, he, he, he practices improvising. He, and of course he, he can improvise because he's a really incredibly highly trained classical pianist as well. And he, he, he's been playing the piano his whole life. Um, so you have to be prepared. Being in a state of Uwe requires training and preparation when you're talking about any kind of skillful activity. I think you introduced this paradox or you, name it really well in your the title of your book trying not to try where if you just tell someone just don't try or just relax that's obviously immediately just upon trying to relax or trying not to try you're introducing some sort of effort and so how do you think about solving this problem i mean i guess to give another example in meditation when you're learning meditation uh practice this is one of the one of the key paradoxes is that if you're trying to get into a meditative state, then you're trying too hard. But at the same time, there needs to be some sort of intention there to aim the mind in the right direction. Yeah, no, it's, um, you really feel this tension the most acutely in things like meditation. Um, but you also feel it in things like insomnia, you know, trying to fall asleep, you're tired, but you need to shut your mind down. But the more you worry about shutting your mind down. Um, so yeah, I call this the paradox of Wu Wei or the paradox of how, of trying not to try, right? The title of the book. Um, I argued in my earlier academic work that this was a real paradox that it was in that it was driving a lot of the philosophizing in early China. It's basically everyone trying to figure out how to get around this paradox. Um, and no one ever solves it. And I argue it's because it's a real paradox. Um, and I had some pushback from my colleagues. Um, but in trying not to try, um, I got more into the cognitive science aspects of it. And it, it makes sense in terms of the cognitive science. Because what you're doing, when I tell you relax, I'm talking to your prefrontal cortex, talking to your cognitive control regions, and I'm activating them. So the part of the brain that I want you to shut down, I'm actually paradoxically activating by telling you to relax or by you telling yourself to relax, right? Um, it's very similar to this paradox um, identified by Daniel Wegner, late social psychologist, um, called it the white bear problem. If I tell you, don't think of a white bear, you've just thought of a white bear, right? Because <laughs> I've activated the concept in your brain. Um, so it's a, that's why it's a genuine paradox. And so the only way around it is, well, there are a couple ways around it. So, you know, um, there are these indirect methods you can use. So, um, so in meditation, you don't want to think about getting into meditation. So what should you think about? Well, count your breaths or pay attention to your breaths or think about this mantra or, you know, think about your chakras being aligned and, you know, going down into the earth. There are all these tricks that meditators use to kind of distract themselves so that they can actually get into the state. 
if you have insomnia and you're trying to make yourself go to sleep and it's not working because it's paradoxical, count sheep, you know, or think of something really boring, <laughs> you know, tell yourself a story that uh, is not too exciting. There, there are all these tricks people come up with for trying to get around the problem. Um, for the Confucians, they give you ritual practices to do. And the idea is that you do these ritual practices, you kind of lose yourself in the ritual and that helps. Um, the, my, my most recent book is called Drunk and it's about the use of why humans use chemical intoxicants. And it was inspired by this paradox because it occurred to me at one point that uh, one way around the paradox is just to bring in an external substance that will do the job for you. So you're, you're nervous because you're about to go out on stage and talk to a thousand people. If I say, relax, be yourself, that's not going to be helpful. Um, but if I give you a glass of wine, that actually might help um, because essentially um, alcohol, to take the most popular chemical intoxicant, is, is going in and directly turning down your prefrontal cortex a couple notches. So it's a kind of chemical way to get around the paradox, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah, it strikes me that tapping into your physiology is it's much harder to use the mind to control the mind than the body to control the mind. So I guess another technique would be the physiological sigh of breathing in two inhales and then an exhale through the mouth or uh, even just smiling might relax the, the body. And there's kind of mixed research on what smiling does for the mind, but it might uplift the mind. And so... Um, probably other hacks related to the body that then impact your mind. Yeah. So doing, doing stuff with your body is, is one of the tricks essentially. And it could be something really simple, like, you know, uh, weeding the garden or doing dishes or, you know, just moving around and doing something with your body can help. Um, the other thing that can help is extreme exercise, actually. So um, there are a bunch of ways to, uh, instead of trying to use your mind to shut your mind down, you can either use a substance to shut it down, like alcohol, or you could use your body to shut it down um, through something like extreme exercise, because extreme exercise has the same effect. It, um, it downregulates your prefrontal cortex. In this case, because you're when you're you know um, stressing your body, your body is like, okay, we don't need the prefrontal cortex anymore. <laughs> Shut that down. You know, send the blood flow to the heart and the lungs and the muscles. Um, so that that kind of high and feeling of effortlessness that people get into when they're engaged in extreme sports is another way to do it. And then another way to do it is actually um, pain. So um, a lot of religious traditions use pain to do it um, or repetition, you know, repetitious physical movements where you're dancing in unison or you're bowing or you're doing something. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of techniques for getting around the paradox and religious traditions have explored all of the various ways to do it. Yeah, you were. It's funny. I was just gonna say it reminds me of all the different ways to alter consciousness that different cultures have come up with over time. And I think of one where I think it's the Tibetan Buddhist tradition where they have to do a certain number of rounds around this mountain, praying the whole time on these padded. Um, they have pads on their elbows and knees, and they're praying on the ground and then kind of like an inchworm almost inching along and they do like 13 rounds around the mountain and then they're able to ascend it and do their meditation. And by then obviously their logical mind has kind of given up or their, yeah, I don't want to oversimplify, but their, yeah, their, their prefrontal cortex is offline essentially at that point. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's physical exertion plus pain. It's probably fairly painful too. So they're using both. Yeah. So cultural traditions around the world have come up with different ways to do this, which is, is kind of, and that itself is cool to explore, right? And it could give you tips about if you wanted to figure out how to get into the state in your everyday life, you could use versions. You're probably not going to do, you know, on your hands and knees around a mountain several times, but some version of that could be useful. Yeah. What's like a modern adaptation? Modern versions of these techniques are, you know, I, for me, uh, weeding the garden <laughs> is, is 
how I do this. There's something really just calming about, um, I think it's a combination of being in contact with nature and plants and outside and uh, something satisfying about, you know, pulling up the weeds and making sure the plants that you're trying to cultivate are healthy and happy. Um, that, that takes me out of myself. Um, but even simple things like sometimes doing the dishes is really relaxing. There's just like warm water. I don't know what it is. I love um, doing the dishes, honestly. Yeah. There's something, um, calming about it. It's probably, it probably is partly the temperature and the water, um, but, and, you know, exercise. So I'll, um, I'll do extreme exercise. Uh, I do like, uh, interval sprinting on the treadmill that, uh, really gets me into a good state. And I'll, you know, I'll sometimes do that if I have some high stakes thing I need to be relaxed for, um, and tennis, you know, a good game of tennis will do that too. What about, I think in drunk, you mentioned microdosing psychedelics. What's your view on that? I haven't done it, so I don't know. <laughs> I've certainly I've macro dosed psychedelics, but I've never tried microdosing. Um, it's possible that um, it's possible that it could work, and it's possible that you know, I talk about this in drunk actually because um, you know I argue that alcohol is there's a reason alcohol is the king of intoxicants. It it really has a set of features that no other chemical intoxicant we know has. Um, but it is, it has drawbacks. It's really physically addictive and is really damaging physiologically. It can really mess up your body. And so I, I'm open to the possibility that maybe now that we can synthesize psychedelics and dose them really precisely. The problem with psychedelics is in their natural state, they're so powerful that they can't be used as a social drug because they just, they completely disable you. You can't, um, you know, write a book, um, or, you know, negotiate a business contract when you're on mushrooms or LSD. Um, but now that we can synthesize psilocybin for instance, and dose it very precisely, it's possible that in smaller doses, you could get some of the same advantages. So the relaxing of the prefrontal cortex, increased crosstalk in your brain, um, enhanced mood. So it's boosting serotonin, um, in a way that still keeps you connected enough to reality that you could function, that you could work and talk to people. And, um, I just, I think it's still very early days. We just don't have enough data on microdosing, um, to know if it, but it's, it's psychedelics. The advantage of psychedelics is that they're not physically addictive and they, they're, they're not physiologically harmful. So if, if they could produce the same kind of effects as alcohol, they would be a much better drug. I guess in my own limited experience, it has been pretty effective for stimulating creativity, but there was a recent paper published that showed that microdosing didn't have too much of an effect, although the caveat is just if you up the dose enough, of course, it's going to have an effect of some sort. So it really depends on how much you're taking and what the chemical is. But um, but I'm interested by a comment you made earlier. You said alcohol is the the king of um of intoxicants, and what are the what are the main reasons for that? It's easy to make. It's easy to discover. You can make it out of anything so people can make it everywhere they go. I mean, all you need is some sugar or starch to make it. Uh, it's easy to dose. Once you know, you know what you're drinking, you know how it's going to affect you. It has very consistent effects across individuals. So, you know, you at 0.08 PAC, um, the cognitive effects you're experiencing are going to be very similar to mine. Um, it also has a short, uh, it's got a quick half-life. So it gets, we have dedicated machinery in our body that's waiting for ethanol and breaks it down and gets it out of our body as quickly as possible. So, um, you can get into an, an intoxicated state and then two hours, two hours later, you're fine because it's been cleared from your body. So it, um, it has a lot of these, so, you know, 
cannabis because people have said, well, especially now that cannabis is getting legalized around the world, maybe that could supplant alcohol. Um, but it doesn't have, and it has some of the same effects as alcohol. It down regulates, regulates PFC, it enhances mood, um, but it has really variable effects across individuals. So, um, you know, I had friends in grad school who would smoke and then get really extroverted and want to talk about philosophy or go dancing. Um, and when I do cannabis, I get really paranoid for about 20 minutes and then I fall asleep. <laughs> it's just really not, uh, it's not helpful drug for me socially. And everyone's like, oh, you just haven't tried the right strain. It's the same, every strain does the exact same thing to me. Um, and this is true, we know this, um, this is just a known in pharmacology that cannabis affects individuals in different, different ways, different individuals in different ways. And it's also hard to dose. Um, if you, you know, you have to know how to hold the smoke in your lungs if you're smoking it. Um, if you're eating it, the the delay between consumption and onset of the effects is so long that it's really hard to dose. Um, so it's, yeah, it's got drawbacks. But on the positive side, it's not physically addictive and it, it's much less harmful physiologically than alcohol is. But, but for now, alcohol just seems to be the best drug we have for kind of gently releasing the hold of the PFC to let you be more creative or let you be more social or more trusting of other people. I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your book, but there is an interesting phenomenon I came across on the web called the Balmer Peak, which is named after this Microsoft coder who said he would get into a flow state after about two to three beers, but then too many and he's sedated and obviously less and he's not quite um, alert enough. So there's kind of this like peak with probably with, with most, most drugs where you're at your cognitive best and then too much and you're just completely in a different world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard about this uh, giving a talk at Google, one of the Google campuses. I was talking about a study, um, where they uh, showed that about 0.08 blood alcohol content, people are at peak creativity. They're best able to solve these lateral thinking tasks. Um, and the first question in the Q&A, someone raised their hand and said, hey, have you heard about the Balmer Peak? Um, and the version they told me is that supposedly um, Steve Balmer would, um, the, 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 where the peak was, was super narrow and it was really easy to overshoot it. And so he would supposedly keep himself on an IV drip of alcohol. He keep himself right at the right, at precise BAC. Which, oh my goodness. Yeah, which is almost <laughs> certainly apocryphal. But um, it captures the sense that, um, yeah, you got to get, there's a sweet spot of just the right amount of inebriation where you're, you're still coherent enough that you can do stuff. You can write, for instance, or, um, you know, write code but you're relaxed enough that you're thinking in a new way. So, um, and then they took me to, they actually took me to their whiskey room on my, they took me on a tour after the talk and they were like, we know where we're taking you first. And they took me to their whiskey room. So they had this room with amazing collection of single malt scotches. Um, and they said, you know, when we get to, you know, part of the, the message of trying not to try is that there are a lot of things that you can acquire through effort and cognitive control, but sometimes there are goals that where cognitive effort is counterproductive. It actually prevents you from achieving the goal. And one of those is when you need a creative breakthrough. And so they said they discovered that when, you know, as a team, they had a coding problem and they couldn't solve it and they kept banging their head against the wall. Instead of pulling an all-nighter and continuing to do the same thing, they would go to the whiskey room and pour themselves a little bit of scotch and sit in these beanbag chairs or play foosball and just, you know, shoot the shit and say, Hey, well, what about this? And often that's when they got the breakthrough, um, by gently down regulating their PFC, um, reducing their inhibitions so that they would share ideas with each other that maybe they would have felt were stupid or they'd be self-conscious about. Um, and so the fact it was seemed very significant to me that an uh, organization is as successful as Google actually builds in 
a whiskey room to their campus. They, they, they make room for kind of just the right amount of intoxication when needed. Um, it seemed to me very significant. Um, it's, it's a sign that they recognize that sometimes to achieve these goals, you can't just keep, you know, sitting in front of your, your computer. Yeah. And my understanding from try not to try and, and your Ted talk is that there's different philosophies on Uwe as to how much effort you should actually put in, in order to then be able to get into an effortless state. Like there's, um, I think Lao Tzu says just basically become effortless um, just like, just do it, just be spontaneous. And then there's other philosophies that say you have to train a little bit and then eventually you can just rely on your training. So I'm curious, maybe you can do a better job of articulating that, but where do you fall on that, um, on that spectrum? So the, it's the, the Confucians tend to emphasize the training, right? They want you to practice and do ritual. And the idea is that eventually it'll become natural and you'll be able to be in a state of Uwe. Um, the, the Taoists say, oh, that training thing's terrible. Stop doing that. Just stop trying or just relax or just make your mind empty. Um, I think you have to understand them as complementary views because I don't think the Taoist view makes any sense except as a corrective to the Confucian view, um, right? Because you need the training. I mean, we don't Lao Tzu uses the metaphor of being like a baby or a child again to capture this idea of kind of relaxing into a non-PFC state. Um, but we don't actually want to be babies again. I mean, it would be really terrifying to have, you know, four-year-olds running the world. Um, we want to cap recapture that state temporarily and in a reduced form. And so I think that the way to understand it is Taoism is this corrective for Confucianism that um, has gone awry, that uh, is 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 uh, continuing on when the with the effort when the effort's now counterproductive. Yeah, totally. I mean, sometimes I do feel like there's four year olds running the world, but I think we yeah, can, yes. can find a balance. Ideally, it would not be the case. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just to wrap up with these rapid fire questions. Are you ready for a few quick ones? Sure. Yep. What is your favorite area of history or science? Uh, warring history, warring states, China, really interesting period. Just one of the most interesting periods of philosophy, I think. Um, science, um, it depends on the problem I'm working on. So recently it's been the science of intoxication, <laughs> how intoxicants affect our brain. Nice. I actually, uh, fun fact, I started a hangover preventative cure when I was in college. Uh, I partnered up with a molecular cellular developmental biology major, and we did some research on what causes a hangover and devised a supplement that's, I think, still out there somewhere. <laughs> Oh, great. Okay. Let's go. Let's use all sell that. Sell it next to copies of drunk. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. So living, if, if you, if you could have dinner with anyone living or dead, who would you invite? Probably Zhuangzi, this early Taoist thinker and Nietzsche really like to see the two of them talk <laughs> via an interesting conversation. Yeah. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Not getting bored. <laughs> Always staying engaged and interested. Definitely true. And one extent, I can see how a lot of people mistake uh, boredom with, or as soon as they feel bored, they get distracted. But I, I assume you mean in the sense of being able to focus on one thing without your mind wandering off or. And, and stay engaged and stay excited. Um, it's easy to get um, bogged down and get bored and distracted. And especially, I think in our modern world with social media, um, this is a just much huger problem. I've noticed it um, affecting my life in ways that I don't like. Um, just how quickly you can get sucked into Twitter, or Facebook, or like looking at videos on YouTube. 
um, that's probably the, my next trade book may be about um, that danger and what we need, some helpful things we can do to kind of stay grounded in the physical world <laughs> in our bodies and not get sucked off into this kind of um, really, I mean, sh the best term I have for it now is shitty flow. Dave Pizarro, the psychologist Dave Pizarro coined that, but we need a better term for that. But it's that that state that chicks me high didn't want to call flow, I think is becoming more and more common because of social media. And um, we need a way to try to steer away from that. Yeah, totally. I couldn't agree more. It's uh, that feeling of where did where did the last two hours go? Oh, they oh, that's right. The YouTube algorithm decided them for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, these you know very clever people are figuring out ways to hijack your mind with this stuff. So um, it needs to be resisted, but it's hard because it's it is so addictive. Absolutely. Um, well, on that note, the, the question I ask everyone is a 15 second commercial. Um, we'll, we'll talk about your books afterwards, but this is more of a, a message you'd like to leave people with for the podcast. We're, I think we emphasize effort in our culture too much. So it's kind of, if you're not successful, what you do, well, you know, just try harder, redouble your effort, um, you know, work, work, work. We're always kind of, um, we feel like we need to be constantly working. Uh, some, there are a lot of important goals in life that can't be obtained through direct effort that actually can only be obtained through relaxing and letting them happen. So I guess the message would be we have to create space in our lives for a way to happen. And we, and we won't do that if we're constantly on our phones or constantly answering emails or constantly trying to do things. We need to stop doing things sometimes and, and just re that'll give us space to relax into this state in a way that I, I don't think we, we provide adequate space in our lives for that now. Yeah. It is tragic that there's not an app for Uwe. Yeah, there could there couldn't be right again. It, there are there is an app for Uwe. It's you know uh, playing tennis or weeding the garden or washing the dishes. It's it's engaging with the physical world. I think that's what the next book is probably going to be about about the importance of f physical things. Well, that'll be timely in in the age of the metaverse. Uh, <laughs> so, well, yeah, I'll look forward to to checking that one out and. Uh, Thank you for coming on. So where can folks find your, your other books? Uh, every, everywhere. Um, Amazon. Uh, they can go to my website where I've got a list of all the books. And uh, so uh, Edward Slaterland, it's just edwardslaterland.com. They can find all my interviews. And this is Trying Not to Try, uh, Ancient China, Modern Science and the Power of Spontaneity, and then Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization. What, was there one before those two? Those are my two popular audience books. Um, yeah, those are the only ones normal people would want to read. <laughs> the rest are academic monographs. So, yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you for coming on the podcast. Great. Right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.